My name is Marina Parkin, and I'm a CPA with Kunz and Parkin. Today, I gave my uh, wonderful business partner, Joanne Kunz, a day off because I'm sure she has talked about bookkeeping <laughs> quite a bit. But I am joined here today by my bookkeeper extraordinaire, Kristen Smith. Kristen is one of my new additions and at the firm. She's been here since the end of last year. And we are really excited to have her with us because she has been instrumental in having a lot of my delinquent bookkeeping clients um, bring up, brought up to speed and as well as doing some educational stuff with uh, some clients who are not quite sure what they're doing with their bookkeeping. So we decided to take this time, it being um, June, and actually today's Tuesday, June 8th. So we're kind of heading into that summer where the tax season ended, the extensions are gearing up as we speak. There's still a lot of cleanup happening post-tax season. And it becomes a good opportunity for people who are either already done with their 2020 tax year or are still in the process of putting their stuff together for extensions to really think about organizing their life in general <laughs> and in their business record keeping in particular. So we wanted to take this opportunity, uh, particularly at this time of year, to talk a little bit about bookkeeping because we get this question a lot from existing clients that have had businesses for years, as well as new clients that are just starting the business to say, you know, what is bookkeeping and um, do I need it? And, and, you know, what do I do? How do I get started? It seems to us people in the industry that it's uh, very self-explanatory. Uh, you know, of course you need it. And of course, this is what you have to do because we've been, you know, relying on a, on the numbers or studying these numbers or, or working with them for so many years. But every time I talk to a client, new client or an existing client, new business or an existing business, it's always that educational part about, okay, well, let me not take for granted the fact that you get the importance of bookkeeping and let's step back and sort of um, discuss what exactly it is and, and what do we have to do. So uh, Kristen, what I thought we would do today is sort of take a little bit of the higher approach as opposed to start beating people down at, at how much they need bookkeeping to first explain, you know, what, who cares? So who cares about whether you as the business have your bookkeeping done? Who wants to see the financial statements? Who really is the user um, of the financial reporting? And maybe if we start kind of talking about it from that high level standpoint, it's going to make a little bit more sense to our business owners that are not necessarily numbers people. So let's, let me ask you this, Kristen, when you are talking to the clients, um, new clients or existing clients, what kind of is the first thing that prompts them to come to you? Why do they need help? You know, who cares about this bookkeeping stuff? <laughs> well, frequently, and, and this is true of all of us, people don't reach out until they're in trouble or they really need help um, documenting their books, documenting their business, um, whether it's, hey, something's gone wrong and I don't know where it went wrong or how I can fix it, or if it's, hey, I, I'm growing really fast and um, I want to understand where I'm growing, where my expenses are, and probably expand. And can I afford to do that? And you can't really assess that situation until you've got proper books in place. Um, a lot of times, in fact, all the time, you're not going to be able to, to get business financing unless you've got financial statements to offer the banks. Um, and you know, in, in these times, especially, um, if you're looking for PPP loans, um, that's really helpful. You have to have that documentation of how your business has gone. Um, but really, from, from a business perspective, uh, it gives you an idea of where you are, where your money is spent, what your profit is each month, and, and how to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. So we had um, kind of two important users, if you will, of the financial statement. One is the bank. And let me elaborate a little bit on this because we saw that, and Kristen, you're right on with these PPP loans as well as just regular business financing. Last year, when all of that started um, kind of coming down and being available for businesses that were in trouble, immediately the banks didn't know what they were asking. So, you know, you really didn't need to submit financials. You really just needed the payroll, but a lot of other 
businesses were applying for IDA loans, in which case you did need financial statements. And then all of a sudden it became a big emergency that I need my financial statements done. And people would say, well, I need it for the bank. And although that you know, COVID emergency subsided and people are still applying for PPP loans, people are still applying for IDA loans right now, but what is happening this year is the new wave of loans for business expansion, um, purchasing building or property or refinancing existing property. So the existing financing, not necessarily an emergency financing, but with interest rates being low, a lot of business people and individuals for that matter that have businesses are applying for these loans. Even if you're an individual owner who is buying a house and they wanna see your business financial statements because that's what you're showing on the tax return. So we have been inundated with these requests to say, well, my bank needs it. So sometimes the bank becomes the number one push for you to kind of get these financial statements done. The bank, really doesn't care that you have a system that is great and has been in place and is useful for any other purpose. But what happens is if you don't have a, any type of system in place at all to come up with a set of financial statements, particularly for multiple time periods, so last two years or last year and year to date, or you know, last three years and year to date, you are definitely looking at scrambling. And of course, at the time when you need it, everybody is backed up, and the the time frame to get in is definitely um, qu you know quite long to get into a professional to get those things done. So the bank becomes sort of a number one important user who is, is really who's creating an emergency. Um, the other one. Kristen, that you mentioned is the owner themselves. So um, you want to have some sort of um, financial history, if you will, or look at the trends in the numbers to decide to make business decisions. And oftentimes when I talk to my small business owners, they say, well, I know how well I'm doing by how much money is in the bank. So I look at my bank account and I say, if there's money in the bank, I must be doing well, everything is great. And that's fine. And that is fine. Of course, that is always sort of taking that pulse and, and seeing how much money is in the bank. However, if you're trying to make long-term decisions to say, should I get into this particular line of business or should I continue you know, paying um, these 10 employees to do this type of work? To make these kind of long-term decisions, you are looking at trends you're looking at relationships between the numbers. So for example, what is your salary or your rent um, or your mortgage payment is a percentage of your revenue uh, or what is your advertising uh, as a percentage of the revenue. So looking at the trends that have been created over the past years help you sort of make a decision on hey, maybe these numbers are, are kind of telling me, and we'll get into that a little bit um, later about kind of some of the things to watch out for in, in the financial statements. So use the owner. Um, budget is really budget. When you set a budget, it's often based on the historical information that has happened in the past couple of years that definitely helps you create a budget. Um, the other, um, of course, the tax return. It would be, I guess, my third one in line is to say, well, the bank needs financials, the uh, owner needs financials for budgeting and decision-making purposes, and then, of course, we have the IRS um, for the tax return. So as the tax person, and Kristen is also um, helping me with tax returns, when people come to us and say, okay, well, I'm submitting all my information for the tax return, and, um, you know, here's my... Um, shoebox of receipts and I was so organized this year because I actually have little folders that I subdivided my receipts in so I'm ahead as opposed to just giving you the shoebox instead of providing some sort of financials um, it's you're paying more likely you're paying more in taxes and you're paying more to your um, tax return preparer for <laughs> sifting all of that um, all in sort of that last minute uh, rush to get your tax return done. So I think that the IRS is definitely another 
um, reason to, you know, have financial statements so you can get your tax return done. And then, of course, you've got all of the other life stages. You know, you're getting a divorce. Sometimes you need to provide the financials. And we've helped uh, several clients when they had to do the financial affidavit. And uh, we had one client in particular a couple of uh, two years ago. The, the numbers were all over the place and uh, she was doing really well. Uh, her business was going up and, you know, she needed to provide the financials to, to for the settlement purposes. And it was just a nightmare. You know, by the time by the time we were able to help her compile all of those numbers, um, you know, we had to do that all over again because the time frame that the attorneys give have provided have said expired. So it definitely was a mess. And she ended up being in a worse position off because, you know, it took so long and then her financials looked completely different on the second round. So uh, you definitely want to make sure that that things are more or less um, in time. Anybody else, uh, Kristen, that you can think of that would really be pushing um, people for financial statements? Um, I guess the other thing that I'm thinking is too, is if you're buying or selling a business, um, that is um, oftentimes the, the culprit for needing financials. Um, we work with a couple of business brokers, one in particular, who is fantastic at actually reading these financial statements and educating his clients uh, what you're wanting to see. And I've had several conversations with him and he says to me, you know, here's the person, they wanna list their business, and they want to sell fast because they need the money, circumstances change, somebody's sick, they need to get or they're moving to a different country. Um, they need to sell the business, they need financials done. Well, now we're talking about last however long the buyer, potential buyers looking at the statements for. So typically in the due diligence environment, we're looking at three years and the current year to date. So now you're looking at around four years worth of financial statements you have to recreate if that's never been done. And you know, if you're looking at buying a business and you're saying, okay, provide me the financial statements, just the fact that they don't have them at the ready is already a red flag. Um, we represent quite a few people in the due diligence process when they're trying to buy a business. And that's the first thing that I always tell them. And I said, okay, here's my checklist of things I need to start looking at the due diligence. Um, but, you know, if, if, if it takes you this long just to provide me with an income statement, then right there, that tells me that you are disorganized. If that something else is off, um, that there's you know, potential for a lot of errors or potentially even fraud. So just the indication of, of what shape the financials come in and how quickly they come in is, is definitely a big indicator right there of what a, what a mess this potential business is. Um, Kristen, even just in our current experience, it's bringing in another partner or getting rid of another partner. Um, that's the other reason we may wanna have um, good record keeping system and financials um, prepared. And one of the things that we've um, talked about a lot is that when you have good records, good financials, um, when you start to purchase larger assets, it helps to have that basis and that history so you can mm -hmm. make a decision on how to purchase it and how to depreciate it. Um, you know, having that history helps make the best advantageous decision for you as a business owner. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I think that's, th these are definitely all important reasons why you would want to have it. And, and again, we cannot reiterate enough that in any of these situations, you always are going to need more than just the current step. You're always going to need some history. And so trying to recreate and going back <clears throat> to set up a set of financial statements going three years back becomes extremely challenging and very expensive and likely not really accurate or useful really at that point. Um, Kristen, let's talk a little bit about then what kind of financial statements, what, what, what is this bookkeeping thing that we do <laughs> result in? Because people, well, well, bookkeeping, what do you do? You know, you put, um, you know, here, here's the QuickBooks file, here's QuickBooks online, here's this, here's that. What is it at the end of this bookkeeping cycle that we're really looking at? Tell me a little bit about some of the common reports that you show your client and, and um, what it is that they mean. So my clients each month get a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet. And what that shows is um, it takes all of their expenditures and it breaks it down according to what they're spending. And that's individualized per business. 
um, because it, it needs to be what the business owner needs to see and what helps them make better decisions for their specific business. Um, but we obviously break things down into things like advertising, what you're spending on your automobile expense, if that's appropriate for your business, um, what you're spending on office supplies, your credit card charges. And that's huge. If you watch that, um, you can make decisions like, hey, the merchant cards uh, vendor just started charging me three times as much as they did two months ago. And then you can change, you know, providers if you need to, to do that. And if you're not focused on that, you'll just keep paying that bill and miss that one entirely. And it really does change very, very widely. Um, so their profit and loss statement says here, here's the amount of money that you brought in um, for this month. And here's the money, amount of money that went out and in what category. So that you can watch that and say, hey, my advertising budget went up hugely in June. Was that appropriate? Did that need to happen? Should we have done that in April so that we got the swing? We took advantage of my busy season. Um, the other thing it does is it gives you a balance statement and your balance statement shows you what you have where, what you have in the bank, what you have owing on credit cards, what you have owing in liabilities. And that's a huge thing too. If you have created payroll liabilities and for some reason your payroll provider has messed up and not paid those, you know that. But if you're not watching that, you could very well owe taxation that, that you're unaware of and that can get you in hot water pretty quickly. So it helps give you an idea of what's going on with your business, if your liabilities are being paid, um, if you're spending too much in one area or maybe not enough, um, but it really breaks it down very quickly and concisely so you can get a quick snapshot of the health of your business. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about a sort of a budget. Can we create a budget in our uh, bookkeeping system, Kristen? Absolutely. Um, and that's kind of what your profit and loss statement does. Because when you're breaking that up, you see what you're bringing in, you see what's going out. And then if you're obviously ending up at a, a negative amount each month, then you go, oops, I need to reevaluate. Mm -hmm. um, and what I also do for my clients once they've been with me for a while is I start to give them a profit and loss of this year in comparison to last year for the same month. That way your marketing trends are pretty similar, COVID notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. um, but you kind of see what needs to be spent in each month and what you need to have in the bank for each month. And, and also sometimes, okay, if you're in an, an industry like real estate that fluctuates with seasons, you know, okay, I'm gonna bring in X dollars for these three months, but it's not gonna be as you know, profit heavy on these three months. And so my budget has to really be this amount across the full six months or 12 months. Um, and you just, you can't possibly predict that unless you see your history and your trends. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely correct. We, um, for people that are using QuickBooks, and we'll get into the QuickBooks and different types of bookkeeping systems later, but uh, for example, for us, we use QuickBooks for financial reporting as a firm. And always at the beginning of the year, I set a budget and every month I'm able to pull budget to actual financials to see, okay, it seems like I'm doing great. I'm doing more taxes or I'm doing less returns or I'm doing some other different services for my clients, but is that in line with the budget or with the expectation that I set? So creating a budget that kind of um, sets the expectation for the financial statement and then looking at budget to actual is another very useful report um, that I always encourage my clients to, to have. Um, Kristen, tell me about accounts receivable, accounts payable. What, what do we want to what do we want to do there? Do we, do we care? We ask, <laughs> oh, well, look, if, if you want to give your business services away for free, then sure, don't care. But, um, but I'm guessing you'd like to know that you get paid for what you do. And so your accounts receivable are really important because you have a system of um, invoices of what is still owed to you. Um, you know, it, it's really great to think in your head, okay, I can keep track of this and I'll know if Mary Smith paid me next month. But as you grow, you're not going to focus on that. It's really easy to lose money's owed to you unless you've got a good system. Mm -hmm. So you're invoicing, you know, right away and if you get into a good habit of doing it as you do your services, it, it makes sure that you know what is still owed to you and make sure that you can follow up if your clients don't pay you or if, if a vendor doesn't pay you. It makes sure that you can follow up and send an invoice, send a statement, show them what they owe you and remind them and keep on that system. Um, in that same regard, accounts payable, um, you know, when you get busy running your business and doing what you do best, it's very easy to forget, oh, I 
spent this on this credit card and I need to pay that bill. Or I spent this with a, an, a home inspector and I need to pay him. It's easy to forget about that. But if you record it, then you can make sure you've paid it. In addition, once you've paid it, you don't lose those transactions. So that when you go to the end of the year and it's tax time, you didn't lose that deduction in your business expenditures. Um, and so in that, in, in the accounts receivable, accounts payable, and then using your bank statement also to make sure that everything that you spent is recorded in your books, then you have all of your expenditures and, and everything owed to you and everything that you owe somebody else. Uh, the other thing that I really like in the AR and AP reporting too is the aging. And, right. and again, it does make it easier if you are using an actual bookkeeping system like QuickBooks or any other type. But even if you are tracking your stuff in, in Excel or in, in the back of the napkin, um, you still want to look at aging. And that's what um, that's another very important report that does come out if you do have a proper system is to see how stale those things are. Um, again, giving our firm as an example, um, we are much better at, you know, sort of collecting as we go and uh, billing people timely. But in the past and very historically in CPA firms, what happens is the tax returns are done and gone, and then you bill at the end of the month. By then, people forget that you've done the tax returns three weeks ago, <clears throat> and then you spend all this time chasing people. And then when you start looking at the aging of your receivables, you get so busy doing other things that when you pull up that report and then you say, well, I just send those invoices. Well, I just send those invoices. Now they're three months late. And when you're looking at that aging, you're going to say the likelihood of collecting those later receivables goes down the older they get. So if you are pulling, if you get in the habit of looking at the aging of your, of your accounts receivable, and send reminders to, to clients and chase them properly, um, then you have a higher likelihood of collecting everything that you are owed um, so that you, you, know, you, you can, of course, get most of your money. Um, it, even back to my early days of when I used to do audits, um, which now seems like a um, lifetime ago, but it did happen. <laughs> um, when I started my career first, and we would go on, um, on financial statement audits of these big companies, and we would pull aging, in order for us to really come up with accounts receivable balance, we had to discount those old receivables and say, well, if they become, you know, over six months, then like 70% of it will be collectible and, and on and on. And as a small, and it may be fine, that's kind of expected in the bigger entity. But when you're looking at a small business where every single client is important and, and it's part of your life, uh, you definitely don't want to get in a situation where you forget about who owes you. And, um, and you sort of then, you know, then you're sending a reminder six months later, and people are like, well, or we, we swear we paid you, it just wasn't applied. So you aging becomes an extremely, extremely important report from the bookkeeping system to pull. Um, and accounts payable, same thing, because like you say, Kristen, you're busy running your business. You've got these uh, invoices and you may forget to pay them or you think that your admin assistant is paying them or, or you know, your spouse is in charge of the bills and then come to find out that, you know, you haven't paid your property tax on your, on your building. In the <laughs> That's a big problem. Or I've even had business owners who've accidentally paid a bill twice and they yeah. have no idea. Mm -hmm. And then they'll have a credit sitting somewhere that um, is a disaster. You've got you've got your assistant. <laughs> the assistant is not oh, happy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so that that definitely from the trash truck. It's very yeah. very. Oh, he's trying to rescue you from the trash man. <laughs> Well, that's all right. Um, I think those definitely looking at at the accounts payable, accounts receivable. So we talked about the income statement. We talked about balance sheet. We talked about the budget, uh, budget to actual. We talked a, a little bit about the comparison of different time periods, um, prior year or month to month. Uh, so those are all important uh, sort of reports that that we look at in you know in the bookkeeping system. Um, 
let's see some of the other things and people always say you know what is a journal and what is a ledger and they get into these little bookkeeping terms and and really i think that that is definitely more important for the bookkeeper because that's really the journal is where all of the entries are made and the ledger is really the summary of that so right. when people say to me oh do, should i take a bookkeeping course in order to do bookkeeping and we say you know we just it's great that to, for you to really understand what's happening, but if you are a great business owner and you do what you do best, it is not the best use of your time to really go back to accounting one-on-one and really figure out what is a journal and what is a ledger and do I need these reports and, and stuff like that. So um, it, it really becomes more of what it is that is really useful in your business. Um, and, and kind of creating those reports. And a lot of times, if you have a great bookkeeping system, you create a dashboard and you have the reports that you're looking at daily, if you will, or weekly in your dashboard. So you're constantly looking at them and seeing, you know, how much do you know people owe me and how much do I owe and what is it compared to last month and so on. Um, Wanted to mention here, we've all been talking about how great it is, but let's talk a little bit about sort of what are the limitations in, in the bookkeeping system? What's, what's wrong with it? What are some of the criticisms that, that you hear clients say? Um, I, on my end, the biggest thing, Kristen, that I get is that it's historical, right? Mm -hmm. The numbers are historical. They are not representative of the current sort of value. Particularly, we get this criticism when it comes to a balance sheet. So if you've got assets that are like real estate or maybe investment in a, another business, the cost of the asset that you purchase remains at historical cost. Um, and that basically is part of the assets that you own. If you have assets such as cash and accounts receivable and maybe inventory because those assets are what we call current so it's they rotate through the business often the fair value of those assets is the same really as historical costs cash is cash and accounts receivable hopefully you have fairly fresh if somebody owes you 100 bucks they owe you 100 bucks um, but when we're talking about real estate or different types of assets or investments in something, they're definitely recorded at, at historical costs. So well, some of the criticism that I get from my clients is to say, well, does this help to tell me how much my business is worth or what is the value of the assets? And the answer is no, that really is not what the bookkeeping system is for. But Kristen, in your experience, have you sort of had to help some clients come up with the um, fair value bookkeeping or, or kind of alternative reports to help them in that regard. Oh, absolutely. Um, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. It, it helps you determine, um, you know, what basis to depreciate your assets on. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, your numbers are what your numbers are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in that respect, we say, oh, well, then why do I care? Um, you care because it shows you what you have in, in you know, a business value overall. And that does change because as you add to your business and add profitability, um, it, it does show you how your business is growing and is worth more. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives you again, that projected trend of, okay, well, how do I want to do this? How do I want to grow this? Um, which, which you can't do unless you've got that mm -hmm. statement of, mm -hmm. of where it's been and where it's going. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're right, you know, so a lot of businesses say, well, I've got to spend what I've got to spend. Yeah. Okay. But do you have the money to do so? Right. And, um, you know, those, those numbers are ever changing mm -hmm. and it's really easy to not feel like they're ever changing unless you're watching it, unless you're keeping track of it. Yeah. Bingo. That's it's, it's really keeping them updated. It's not something that you kind of create once like a balance sheet, for example, when you assemble on the list of assets that you have, uh, less the liabilities that you owe. Um, it's not something you do once. It's something that you kind of have to do on periodic basis, whatever that period of time is that works for you, whether it's every month, every quarter, every year. But but it definitely is. The, and the other thing on that front too that I tell my clients is, yes, you may not be able to see what your business is worth or the value of your assets just by looking at the balance sheet. But at least it gives you sort of a picture in a moment in time 
of what it is that you have and then what it is that you owe. So if you want to take that list and you want to get a valuation for your business, this is your starting point to get there. So if let's say I had a client as recently as last night email me and was thinking of um, interested in selling her business and says, hey, I want to... Um, you know, can you help me with evaluation, which we don't do valuation in house, but I said, you know, we've got your financial statements, that is your starting point, you're going to assemble these lists of documents, and then you're going to hire a valuation service entity to really help put that together, but it's going to be important first to say, okay, I've got this land, I've got this building, the building is five years old, this is how much depreciation has been taken, these are the improvements, and now you're going to have the professional take that and create a value for it so that you, it, it, but it's helpful instead of kind of starting from ground zero to say, I don't even know what I have. I don't know what my accounts receivable are. I don't know. I think I have a loan receivable from somebody. Somebody owes me money. I don't even know how much it is now. Well, is there interest on it? I don't know. So when you really start to, to track that properly, even when it is cost, uh, historical cost basis, it at least gives you a picture of what those assets are that if you ever wanted to get them valued, you kind of have a starting point. Um, the other thing that, of course, I want to mention again to, to go into the whole, uh, the need to keep this consistent is that your bookkeeping system is only as good as you know your last bank reconciliation. <laughs> you know, we, we say you, you know, we're all we're only as strong as the weakest link. So if you let this go, it doesn't matter that your 2020 was perfect and that we finished the tax return and that it looks fantastic and you're really happy. If we're now in June, you haven't reconciled the bank in five, six months, you haven't kept up with categorizing your expenses, and you really haven't looked at your receivables and payables, you don't have a bookkeeping system. Yeah. Because six months has passed, and you're done. Now, it's is it easier to catch up on six months as opposed to six years? Yes. But you need to get into a habit of doing the stuff periodically. So I I cannot stress enough. I always, you know, it's it's really as good as the last reconciliation. If I pull a QuickBooks file, the client says, okay, here's the backup of my QuickBooks file. Can you take a look and let me know? And then I, the first thing I do, and I've also been trained by one of the bookkeepers, uh, Kristen, that I, I uh, have, you know, helping a lot of our clients. She always says to me, anytime you restore a file for a client, take a look at when was the last reconciliation done. <laughs> <laughs> she's got that drilled in my mind and when I look at that and I say hmm I'm looking at this file but the reconciliation was done you know a year ago I'm not sure how useful all of this stuff is because you may be shoving things in and you don't even know if they cleared the bank and you don't even know if you paid for them by the, the credit card you don't know what those payroll liabilities are Kristen like you said if have they been paid is your payroll company properly taking them out of the account so all of those things um, are really, it's, it's really important that we keep track on it periodically. Do you have to have a monthly system? Well, maybe for a specific type of business, maybe it is too often. Maybe you don't do, maybe you are a real estate investor and you really don't need monthly financial statements because your properties are, you have a few big properties that are really maybe not doing too much in the meantime, if they're not being rented. So you just kind of want to track maybe once a quarter to see what costs are being incurred, just to see how much it's costing you to carry these things. Maybe if you are a business that's providing a service, yes, we definitely want to look at your stuff monthly, again, because of receivables and payables. And you may have a business where once a year is sufficient. It just really all depends on what the needs are. And but but the idea here is that we do this periodically and consistently. Every period that we pick for reporting is um, what's going to kind of track you um, as you go forward. So that is really my. Um, sort of what, what's wrong with the system, like kind of the pros and cons of having a bookkeeping system. Um, any other criticisms, um, 
Kristen, that you get from your clients, like, well, I don't really don't need this, or this is an overkill, or this is too much, or whatever. Anything like that that you get from from your people that you work with? <laughs> well, I mean, yes, and and some of those concerns have changed. Um, some people say, why is this worth it? Why mm -hmm. why is it worth paying a bookkeeper? Why is it worth doing the time? And I've been doing this for a lot of years, and I will tell you this: that you will never document where your business is as accurately unless you have good bookkeeping and you will lose expenses. You mm -hmm. will lose the ability to make better decisions going forward. Um, you know, if, if you are not capturing every expense for your business and putting that on your books, it's just not, not a good thing because you are, you're going to come to tax time and not have that. And you're going to show a different story than what is actual. Um, and you know, people say, well, oh, it, it's too hard to pull bank statements. Oh, it's too hard to reconcile my bank statement. And um, not to delve into QuickBooks too early, but there are software platforms out there that really minimize the amount of time that you have to spend. You can even have the, the transactions auto fed into your books. Um, that does not mean that you don't need a bookkeeper or somebody in your organization to focus on if that's an accurate statement. Um, but there are tools there that, that you can use that do minimize the time that you have to spend on pulling things in. Um, you know, we're, we're in an age of, of technology. And so I think a lot of people just, when they're good at real estate or they're good at design or they're good at sales, they wanna focus on that. They don't wanna focus on mm -hmm. bookkeeping. Um, it's only weird little geeks like me who like this stuff. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, you know, I think I like about it. I just don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I get that. But um, if you have systems in place to deal with it, mm -hmm. then people like me can help you do what you do best mm -hmm. and give you that time. Yeah. And I think that's, it, Kristen, that's exactly the key. It becomes yet another tool in your tool belt of running your business. As right. opposed to yet another thing to do that just kind of goes in nowhere it becomes a tool. And that's something that our business coach often, a coach often tells us is, you know, he says, you guys are, well, you're, you know, you're, you're an accountant, you're a lawyer, and you deal with numbers all the time. And of course, you kind of take it for granted, but take off your accountant hat and put on your business owner hat. And look at the financial statements and say, what does this mean to me? Use your financial, instead of saying, oh, I got to reconcile my financials. Kristen, can you please help me? I have to, <laughs> at the end of that, say, what does this mean? Does this have any meaning to me? And how can I use this to run my business? And I think that's really the key is that instead of it being a burden, you have to look at it as once you have it, that it's going to help you make whatever business decisions and the key is also to tailor your reporting so that it does help you in the business decisions. Back to kind of having that dashboard view. Um, I have a client who they have QuickBooks file, but they have uh, over time, and it helps that um, the, one of the, the owner's spouse is, you know, a, a kind of a geek, Excel geek, like, <laughs> like, <me. laughs> like Kristen here. Um, <laughs> so she has created something custom to the business kind of like a dashboard where she pulls the important pieces from the reporting system where every morning or once a week when they have their team meeting, she pulls up that dashboard and she says, how much money is in the bank? How much money do people owe us? How many jobs do we have cooking at the time? What is our deposits from customers? What is our you know, current inventory? So it's the things that you wanna kind of see right away, which would be, and that's what the owners who actually do the work, who go out and bid jobs, that's what they wanna see. They don't really necessarily care to see the whole P&L every week when they have the team meeting, but it's important that she was able to identify what pieces of information are critical in the decisions that they're going to make at that time meeting has created that custom dashboard. But what makes it um, possible is that their bookkeeping is up to date. So every morning, let's say they have their team meeting on Thursday afternoon, when they pull those reports, it's like, oh, well, we got this happening. That means that up to Wednesday, um, you know, Wednesday night, the bookkeeping is clean. 
and they're able to pull correct data and really use it in decision making. So it is really picking out the things that are going to be important to you and keeping just staying on top of it with help um, and, and, and stuff like that. So that kind of brings me to sort of the last topic, which probably for a lot of people who've logged in today may be one of the first things that they wanted to hear, which is what systems are available? Like, what is the bookkeeping system? What do I do? How do I do it? What are my options? What are my choices? And, and you know, how do I get started? So I guess let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Kristen, I was going to start with the very simplistic um, system. Number one is um, do the, the do-it-yourself system. <laughs> oh, oh boy, the shoebox. The okay. Shoebox. The shoe bottom with the divider folders. Okay. Um, yes. If you were to do this yourself, study. what would you, what, where would they begin? How would they best do it if they're starting and they're maybe don't have quite the volume and they don't quite have the money? How would you recommend they get started with, with, you know, what, what best system they can create or do it yourself? <laughs> well, again, not to, not to be redundant, but QuickBooks is, is widely available. Um, everybody's very familiar with QuickBooks. They, they you know, offer, it's owned by Intuit, which is a, a, a blanket company. So they provide lots of software. So it works with a lot of different things, but essentially QuickBooks is um, your basic bookkeeping software system. And it's readily available. It's really inexpensive. You can do desktop, you can do online. So the, you know, we're seeing a huge migration from people going from desktop QuickBooks to online QuickBooks. Um, and so it's as easy as if you're a business who's just started out and you're not really ready to bring on more staff, but you, but you do want to keep track of your expenses and your accounts receivable, your accounts payable until you are to the point and that having the books is, bookkeeping system will help you decide when you are at that point that you can hire a bookkeeper, you can hire more staff, et cetera. But you would start out with, you can even do online QuickBooks. I think it's $14 a month to start. Very, very simple. And it's not built for bookkeepers. Um, it's built for business owners, um, which, you know, it's not to say that you won't get stuck. There is help available. We offer help if you get stuck. Um, but it makes you have a very easy system of putting in your expenses, putting in your income, um, getting started. So you can even just go to the quickbooks.com website, create your small business books and start from there. Mm -hmm. I think that with the QuickBooks Online, um, I had one of our, Leslie Lutz, who's my other bookkeeper extraordinaire, who does quite a bit of bookkeeping for my clients. I've worked with her quite a bit. Leslie, thank you so much for listening in and, and giving me your comments. Leslie just chimed in and said that um, QuickBooks Online, in her experience, she noted that it, it is getting a little bit better it as is. time goes on. It, where in the past, and you know, for me, um, I am kind of the user of the financial statement. So once I have the QuickBooks file, my job is to pull the reports I need for the tax return or whatever other reporting I'm helping the clients with. So I always roll my eyes at QuickBooks Online, but um, you know, from what you're telling me and from what my other bookkeeper contacts are telling me is that it is um, becoming a little bit more user-friendly where you can easier pull things that you need and kind of a little bit easier to get around as far as the, as the um, client is concerned, the business owner, right? Very much so. Mm -hmm. it, it makes it very easy to log on, access it. You can access it from anywhere. Um, we've got a lot of, of business owners who aren't pinned to a specific office. So if you're out and about, um, you know, working from home, obviously becoming more common, um, you're out and about, your customer calls and says, did I pay this invoice? You can check right away and see if it's there. Um, it, it gives you access to your books anywhere, anytime. Um, which is not to say you want to go with desktop. Hey, I'm all about desktop. Um, it just it all depends on your business needs. But, um, you know, five years ago, anyone told me that they had QuickBooks online, I really cringed. I will be honest. I cringed. Um, now it's just, it's, it's very user friendly. There are some little hiccups, um, but they're constantly pushing to better the software every day. Mm -hmm. And those updates happen and it's, it's very user friendly. 
I think the big kind of the bigger challenge uh, for the business owners that are using QuickBooks without getting any help from outside in terms of even reviewing it on a periodic basis is the mapping of the accounts. So <clears throat> they kind of understand that they want to track advertising expense and travel and meals and, and office supplies. But if you don't map those accounts to, let's say, income statement, I've seen those things show up God knows where. Uh, so we definitely want to maybe get some help um, on the initial setup. Um, and that too is if you kind of want to, as a client, if you want to do your own bookkeeping and you want to give it a try, at least get a little bit of help in the initial stages with setting up and mapping your chart of accounts. So as you're entering things, it's already feeding into the right report. And then we can also teach you how to pull the reports that you need, as we just discussed, what is going to be useful to you, create those reports. But once the accounts are mapped, then they can kind of go uh, whichever we, you know whichever we, uh, way that um, is going to be helpful to you. Um, the the thing that scares I think people, Kristen, from QuickBooks is that it is a, a kind of a double entry system in that when it populates income statement, it populates the balance sheet as well. So. A lot of times people want something a little bit more simpler where they don't necessarily have to track or worry about the balance sheet and is this going and I don't even know what retain earnings are and what do you mean equity <laughs> that makes no sense to me does that mean it's the cash in the bank so the the kind of the bigger criticism with the um, with the double entry bookkeeping um, I often tell my clients there is some other products out there that if you just wanna kind of track your just expenses and you kind of wanna categorize them, there's other options, which I think are also Intuit product like FreshBooks. I have a couple of clients using that. Uh, any experience with FreshBooks or something similar, Kristen, on where it's just really you're tracking the income statement part of it? Um, we've even had clients just use Excel uh, mm -hmm. and it, it depends on if you're comfortable using Excel. Um, there are, there are a few applications through Microsoft um, that are just on your computer, Microsoft budget um, that you can use. They're very limited. So it, it'll just track, like you said, the income statement. Um, but, but there are certainly are apps available. If, if and I, I have a lot of small businesses who don't use a desktop, they just use their phones. There are some phone applications for, for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, just, just make sure that you're always reconciling with your bank to make sure you're not losing those expenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, a lot of times when the clients are completely adamant about kind of doing it themselves, they say, just start with, with Excel. Uh, because even with the Excel, even we can help set up just a list of expenses. And oftentimes I'll give them kind of a list of basic office expenses, or let's say if it's a realtor client, we have a, a typical realtor expenses and we just say, Hey, just set it up set it up, set up an Excel spreadsheet where it goes month to month. And then every month you sit down and you populate those boxes with each type of expense. What makes it nicer is that when they're ultimately ready for um, a real bookkeeping system is we can just import those numbers in. Whether we enter them or or import them in Excel or whichever way, there's already a system in place where we've got historical data. We may have some opening numbers um, and uh, comparatives and stuff like that. So it's definitely good to, even if it's just Excel um, or like a version of Excel. The nice thing with uh, things like FreshBooks is that it, like you said, Kristen, you can even do it on your phone where you can categorize the expense. And then when you create a report, the the category the the report already pulls it by category as you assigned it to be, um, so I think that is helpful. Is that it just kind of does a little bit of work for you, but again, it's as good as what you're putting in. So if you're gonna categorize, then you can definitely pull the reports. Um, I got some of my clients uh, chiming in here with some great comments about. Um, if you're converting from QuickBooks uh, desktop to QuickBooks online, don't do it in the middle of the year. Definitely do it at the end of the year or as of January 1st, particularly if you've got payroll tax or if you've got sales tax, the conversion doesn't necessarily work. Um, 
The, the other thing too, and Kristen, I know you're working on a client right now with the QuickBooks Online that does invoicing. And you can do invoices from desktop, you can do invoices from QuickBooks Online, but that's the other definite benefit of using QuickBooks is the ability to invoice and invoice quickly, send the invoices to clients. Um, so it's kind of more timely and, and um, you know, as we go. So I think that is the benefit of using a little bit more um, sophisticated system like QuickBooks. Um, what other things do we have? Do we have something that's even more complicated and do we even need it? I know it used to be, what is it, Great Plains or what, <laughs> what those old things are? <laughs> well, it's kind of funny. A lot of those old software products have merged um, mm -hmm. and, and been bought by Intuit, ironically. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes Intuit's taking over the world. Yeah, <laughs> but they've um, taken over Lacerd, that's for sure. So yes, <laughs> they've, they've taken over. It's um, yes, there are. I um, mm -hmm. in the small business realm, and when I say small business, you know, we we have clients with um, a couple million dollars in in transactions annually, and we're still able to adequately handle their books yeah. and QuickBooks. So really, to be beyond that, yes, there are absolutely solutions that you can do that. Um, you would have to have a very specific business and a, and a high transaction rate to really require a heftier tool than mm -hmm. what QuickBooks offers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I don't, be, I, yeah, go oh, ahead. <laughs> um, when, when that becomes more necessary is when you're doing a lot of inventory that has to be handled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a great point. That's a great point. And for us and our experience, really um, most of our clients are able to utilize the QuickBooks, even if they do have to customize it a little bit. Even our builder clients that do have those deposits and work in progress inventory are still able to get the QuickBooks um, to, to customize to their needs. And there is even like the construction version, there's the inventory version. I think, again, a lot of it has to do with getting some help to help you set up and kind of getting it um, to the point where it's usable and you can pull the reports that you need from there. Um, just again, using it as a tool. So I think that we've um, sufficiently uh, scared everybody, Kristen, about the need to, to keep their records and create a good bookkeeping system and have the financials on the ready for no matter what life throws at them. Um, any other sort of words of wisdom to part? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so I, I think that we've maybe inundated our clients, so everyone please, um, you know, deep breaths here, because this is a lot of information all at once, and a, and a lot of us trying to convince you, but the reality is, is that bookkeeping, when you start out, is very simple, and that there are, you can, you can go to different depths of it, so as a business owner, you can start with QuickBooks, you can start with a, a platform, and you can use it. If you are doing that on a regular basis, you are going to help yourself, even if that's just so that it's more prepared when you hand it over to the CPAs. Mm -hmm. um, so don't, you don't even necessarily have to think about your general ledger. You don't necessarily have to think about all those other reports. If you are just putting in your expenses, if you're mm -hmm. just putting in the, the deposits that come into your bank, you are... 90% ahead of the game. And then it's easier for somebody like me to come in and help you or the CPAs to go in and, and assess what you need as far as tax time. Mm -hmm. So don't let the fear of it push you away from using the tool of it. That's fantastic. I love that. I'm so glad <laughs> this is recorded. It is available. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Now, it, those, those words of wisdom will stay on forever. And speaking well, I, of that, I think off, that's what happens. Uh, yeah. Because clients get very intimidated and they go, I don't know about it, so I don't want to do it. Yeah. And, you know, what I was gonna, just going to say is that we, we are, webinars are recorded. And so for those that are tuning in today, you've got your business friends that are all have different opinions about it. We really encourage you to have them go on our website or YouTube and search us and just have them listen to even a little bit of it. Um, I think sometimes when you're hearing it from somebody who's got boots on the ground that are actually doing the tax work and the bookkeeping work helps to 
highlight the importance of it and maybe take a little bit of the fear away to know that there's support there. So uh, we definitely thank all of you guys for, for tuning in. We will be back next Tuesday, um, which will be June 15th. And next Tuesday's topic is establishing Florida residency, which is also very timely as people continue to move to this beautiful state away from the cold and away from bad COVID. Um, and so we're, we're definitely going to be highlighting uh, different factors and what it takes to establish Florida residency. So thank you so much, Kristen. I love it. The great points today. And thank you everybody for tuning in and we will see everybody next Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks guys. <laughs>